<clears throat> okay, so hopefully the recording started. Um, right, so uh, welcome everybody to VAST. Um, just wanted to say a couple of things before we get started here, just despite uh, graduate student sort of being in the title, um, attendance is, is pretty much open uh, and people backgrounds can vary quite a lot. So um, just like to ask the people, uh, you know, just be respectful to your friends and colleagues here. Um, please do ask questions, um, just sort of in a traditional seminar format. Uh, the primary goal here is, is for this to be sort of a positive learning experience for everyone. Uh, perhaps the easiest way to ask questions is to uh, politely interrupt um, and just ask out loud and unmute yourself. Um, you can also, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on chat, so you can just type your question in chat and uh, I can try to relay it to the speaker. Um, right, I think, I think that's pretty much it. So with that being said, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ben Tai from the University of Chicago, who will be telling us about uh, extending differential forms across singularities. All right, thanks. Um, right, so maybe I'll start off by saying like what I do and uh, what, what I research is, you know, Hodge theory and uh, singularities of, you know, spaces that you might see in the first or second course in algebraic geometry and, um, you know, generalizations of these things. Um, so the talk will definitely be of this flavor, but I hope that at least for the first half, maybe we can just kind of get introduced to some of the terminology and uh, uh, get our feet wet with some of the uh, uh, yeah, the language and the theorems that you might see um, in my field, because Hodge theory can be kind of a, a niche subject, especially when you start work working with uh, singularities. Uh, throughout, though, to kind of get started, um, we're going to let X be one of these two things. We're going to either let it be a projective variety over the complex numbers, which uh, You've taken an algebraic geometry class, you know this is just going to be like some subset of projective space cut out by polynomials. Um, and otherwise, um, we're going to be working with like closed complex analytic subspaces of complex projective space. And um, I make these distinctions for the moment just because I want you to be able to, you know, hopefully you know or are comfortable with one or two of these things. You're either kind of comfortable with uh, analytic spaces in like some Euclidean standard topology, that's where the complex analytic spaces are coming in. This is where complex manifolds are. If you're not comfortable with complex manifolds, maybe you're comfortable with smooth manifolds and the jump isn't that big. Uh, or you're comfortable with just like algebraic geometry. You've, you know, you've done schemes, but maybe you never took a smooth manifolds class. Uh, if you've not done either, this is going to be a very fun talk for you. Um, so let's buckle in. And as we'll see later, um, let me point out here that I make these distinctions um, in kind of a uh, uh, kind of a winky kind of way because it turns out that for all intents and purposes, these things are going to be the same objects. That analytically or algebraically, you know, we're kind of going to be studying the same things, and I'll mention that a little bit later. But if you aren't familiar with uh, these subjects or you don't do algebraic geometry, here are kind of some of the names of the objects that you might study in this field. And those include elliptic curves, Riemann surfaces or algebraic curves, kind of going back to this thing that I'm alluding to that they're the same, uh, K3 surfaces, Calabia varieties, Fano varieties, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you might have heard these names before. These are kind of the objects that um, I play around with in Hodge theory um, and study specifically. Um, maybe you've heard these names before, and this is kind of like the, the field where these things show up. All right, before delving into the, the singular world, maybe I'll start off by talking about what happens when things are nice and smooth. Uh, so for the moment, we're going to let X just be a smooth projective variety, or um, in the analytic sense, we're just going to let X be a, a projective complex manifold. And so like us, you know, Complex manifolds aren't too different from smooth manifolds. They just are, they have, they're locally CN for some N with some sort of rigid analytic structure. And so as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about differentials. And so let's try to make sense of what kind of differentials we can study um, in this world. So uh, a holomorphic one form on X is just an object omega uh, that lives in this uh, thing, capital omega one. 
uh, which locally looks like, you know, FIDZ, um, where FI is just a holomorphic function and the Z or ZI are just holomorphic coordinates. Okay, so on your manifold, you're gonna have, you know, coordinates. So maybe I'll say a little bit more about that. So if X is a complex manifold, you're gonna have real coordinates on here because C, you know, complex spaces also can be considered as a real two space. And then so real, you know, complex N space can be considered as real two N space, okay? Where each of these things can be written as like the real part of some coordinate and like the imaginary part. So maybe I'll put some eyes here with uh, I here also being the complex, <laughs> the, the imaginary unit. All right, and so you can think about a complex manifold as being, uh, uh, have locally being coordinates in holomorphic coordinate ZI, maybe I'll call it ZI here, holomorphic, and ZI bar, which are anti-holomorphic. And so I'm really just looking at differentials which are attached to differentials of these objects, okay? And a holomorphic P, P form, just like in the smooth case, I can just take their wedge. I can take wedges of one form to form P forms, and they just are locally going to look like these things. And if you don't like, you know, if you don't know what locally means, all that means is that these objects are going to glue together well with the local structure on the manifold. So kind of how you form partitions of unity in the smooth, you know, for smooth manifolds in order to get like differentials and gluing things to together in the complex sense that makes you know sense as well and algebraically or you know even analytically the local condition is just saying that this object here omega p or omega one upstairs is going to be a sheaf if you don't know what a sheaf is that's fine it's just something that you're able to you know you want these things to be able to glue together locally okay and so maybe let's do an example you know to make sure that we you know, this, that this object isn't too scary. Uh, let's look at uh, x lambda, let this be the elliptic curve, which just locally looks like this equation. So maybe you've seen this before. Um, I'm letting this be a subset of c squared with coordinates x and y. But of course, you know, we can compactify this, just add a point. That's what I'm talking about to get this x lambda, which sits inside p squared. Okay, but since you know what we're talking about our local things, you know, let's just look at the affine equation because it's much easier. Uh, you can check since this is a polynomial uh, that x lambda is smooth, except at these points zero, one, infinity, infinity being this point we add to compactify. And because you know we're only working with two variables, there's just going to be you know pretty much one form, one one form on this guy, omega, which I'll call omega lambda which what do we do? We just take the differential of each side and we get this object dx over y, which is going to be dx over the square root of the guy on the right side. And so what you can check is that this is holomorphic away from the bad points, zero, one, and infinity. And the point I'm trying to make here is that these are just what the objects are. You're doing exactly what you would do in the smooth case. Um, and what you're wanting to check now is that instead of it like being smooth or continuous, the adjective here is holomorphic. Okay, and here's a cute picture of how maybe omega is uh, related to uh, constructing the elliptic curve and how you get the torus. Uh, topologically, you take two paths, you cut these things um, along some branch cuts in red. Um, do a gluing procedure to get this torus here. This is what the, uh, the space x omega guy is here. And as it turns out, this is kind of just an aside. Once you know, in this case, what omega lambda is, you actually know what x lambda is for lambda not equal to zero, one, or infinity. But this is, a, this is just an aside. OK, and what can we do with these things? Well, since we're working with complex uh, coordinates, you know, we can take the form. We can take its conjugate. 
we can wedge with these things and we can integrate because it's a smooth complex manifold. So all these things make sense um, in the complex world. And going a little further, if you've taken the smooth manifolds class, it turns out that because this guy is holomorphic, it's closed and therefore defines a class in the Duram cohomology with complex coefficients. And this is defined the same way as it is um, in a smooth manifolds class. But now you're just emphasizing that it's you know, a complex thing. Okay. So again, what am I trying to say here? I'm just trying to say that you know, these objects shouldn't be too different from what you've studied before if you've seen them. Okay. Any questions before I move on? Rad. Okay. So this is one way of describing differentials in the analytic world. Now let's go to the algebraic world. Um, let's go to Hartshorn and make sense of algebraic differentials, uh, which we can also define locally. So if, let me kind of define this as generally as I can for the moment. So let A be a C module. A derivation is a module homomorphism from A to M to a module M satisfying these usual conditions uh, you want your functions to vanish when you take the differential. So for uh, W and C, those guys are going to vanish uh, when we apply D to it. Uh, it's linear in addition. So DF plus G is equal to DF plus DG. And then it does this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Leibniz rule type thing in three, that if you take multiplication, it's going to be uh, DFG is equal to FDG plus G. Yeah. So this is just what a derivation is. And going upstairs in the holomorphic sense, we want uh, these things to, to hold as well. And so the definition slash theorem, um, which you would see in Hartshorn, is that the module of algebraic differentials is kind of just like the unique object for which there is a universal differ uh, differential. And so I'm going to avoid describing the universal property uh, just for brevity, it's not very hard, um, but there is kind of a universal object for which this makes sense um, and, a, and a universal different, uh, differential, but this is going to be exactly what you think it is. So it's kind of exactly this, uh, uh, once we make sense of this uh, um, for projective varieties, once we move from modules to projective varieties, um, it's going to be exactly what you think it is. Um, one quick remark. Um, so Hartshorn calls these Kähler differentials. Um, I am myself trying to avoid using Kähler, uh, the name Kähler, as much as I can. Um, he wasn't the best guy in the world. Um, uh, Nazi sympathizer for many years after World War II. Um, unfortunately, in my field, his name comes up almost all the time. So it's hard to avoid it altogether. But I figured, you know, Kähler differentials are the same as just like algebraic. So why, why use it when uh, for something silly like that? But uh, so I will be calling them algebraic differentials. Okay, and then um, so what are differentials for projective varieties? What are these algebraic differentials? Well, basically, you know, you take x, your projective variety, um, and then you just take the sheaf associated to this module downstairs. So locally, you know, since you're a variety, these guys look like, you know, spec of some ring. And if you don't know what spec is, just think about this as like being some sort of nice uh, module of polynomials mod an ideal. Okay, so locally, these things look like this um, in some topology. And so Locally, the sheaf of algebraic differentials is just do this operation we were just describing upstairs, take this universal object, and then sheafify it. Okay. And I'm being purposefully vague because what I'm about to say is that the out, you know, over C, um, the, two, the, the two processes that I just described very briefly, the holomorphic and the algebraic world, are going to be the same. So if you've seen this already, you know what it is. If you don't, haven't seen it before, that's okay. You probably will understand this just well enough without needing the technical definition. And 
So the algebraic differentials, um, while kind of nuanced to define outright, they do have have very nice properties. So for example, you've probably seen this in Hart term before, that um, if X is a projective variety, then X is smooth if and only if uh, this object uh, omega alg is um, a locally free sheaf of rank the dimension of X, or you know, in the analytic sense, this is equivalent to this being a vector bundle of uh, uh, rank the dimension. So if you're not smooth, basically this thing is detecting where the singularities are. It's going to jump somehow. OK. Um, but this is a hard shorn thing. Uh, you don't need to define this over C. All these things um, algebraically make sense over a field, over, uh, you know, over a, just for a scheme. Um, but what I'm about to say, for the most part, uh, as I'm stating it, really is only going to make sense for smooth things over C. So. Here are some big theorems where you see these differentials show up. Um, you might have heard of these before. Um, they're used um, all the time in uh, complex algebraic geometry. They're very useful tools. Um, so let X be a smooth projective variety over C of dimension M. Then we have these like four nice things. So the first one is a, a variation of Chow's, you know, a version of Chow's theorem. And this is what I was alluding to before, that analytic subspaces of complex projective space are algebraic. And so what do I mean by this? Well, polynomial equations are holomorphic, right? Um, as long as they're smooth, um, they give off smooth equations. Um, so yeah, if, if I give you a series of polynomials and their uh, Jacobian doesn't vanish or doesn't drop in rank, uh, these things are gonna etch out holomorphic functions. So um, what this is basically saying is that any analytic subspace X of CPN, any smooth guy is going to be um, locally given by polynomial equations. And so in particular, we can make sense of identifying these two objects together and I put this equivalence in quotation marks because, well, if you know both of these subjects, the analytic topology, considering these spaces, is different from like the Zariski topology, the topology you would study on schemes. And so, basically, the formal way of constructing, you know, Chow's theorem is by uh, constructing a functor from the algebraic category to the um, analytic category. But basically, everything that you would want to be able to say. Um, about these sheaves is just going to be the same once you kind of forget the topology, which is hard for sheaves, but that's kind of how I think about it. Uh, the next one is Serre duality, which um, does hold in any characteristic, but how I'm stating it is um, uh, actually how I'm stating it also holds um, in any characteristic, at least for smooth things. So let uh, little omega x uh, be the top wedge of the sheaf of holomorphic differentials here. So just take the top wedge of these guys. So we're looking at M forms. Uh, then for any locally free sheaf F or for any vector bundle, uh, we have this identification between these cohomology groups here. Okay. And so um, in particular, we have this identification between the cohomology groups of um, the omega p's and the omega n minus p's. There's this duality between these guys. And yeah, so Serre duality is a very important theorem. Uh, the first place you would probably see applications of Serre duality are in Hartshorn or uh, Griffiths and Harris's book on complex algebraic geometry. Um, probably the easiest one would be proving like Riemann rock for curves is the first place it comes up or anything having to do with uh, studying the geometry of complex surfaces. Yeah, so uh, Serre duality is one of those big theorems that Hartshorn proves, and it's used all the time and uh, for calculations, especially if you're working with cohomology. Uh, another one is Kodaira vanishing, which only holds in characteristic zero in general. Um, so you wouldn't see this in Hartshorn's book. Um, so if L is an ample line bundle, which just means that it's a nice enough um, a nice enough sheaf, uh, then we have this vanishing of this cohomology group here that the HK of X omega X 
times L vanishes for K greater than or equal to zero. So again, we have this object showing up in Kodaira vanishing, which has to do with the differentials that I was describing. So somehow there is a relationship between differentials and like this, you know, these, these their, their cohomology. In particular, if I rewrite things, you know, because it's smooth, all these omega p's are going to be invertible. Um, we're able to say that the uh, uh, cohomologies vanish in some certain range when we just replace omega x with uh, lower degree forms. Okay, so we have nice vanishing of these uh, the cohomologies of these differentials. Uh, Kodaira vanishing. Um, where would you see that? Um, Kodaira vanishing shows up, I believe, in the proof of the uh, Kodaira Enriquez classification of surfaces. Um, it's used to classify what kind of surfaces show up in algebraic geometry, um, uh, which is probably what you would see in like a first or second course on complex algebraic geometry. You probably see this classification somewhere. Okay, and then the last one is the Hodge decomposition, probably the the least known of the three. If you're def if you're not doing this field, um, which says that for each k, the singular cohomology of x can be decomposed into the cohomology of these differentials, and in particular, and this is the nice part, that the complex conjugate of one uh, gives you uh, uh, the cohomology of another. So the HQX of omega P is the HPX of omega Q. Um, and so this really does only hold in characteristic zero. Uh, this was observed, um, I, think, I think by Hodge, I can't remember if his proof was right on this, but um, the proof you know, uses uh, uh, um, harmonic analysis. Um, and as I've stated it, this is the only way you can prove the Hodge decomposition right now. There are algebraic proofs um, by Deline and Illuzi proving that something like this is true um, using characteristic P methods, but you can't get quite the, this nice statement here. You can't get this complex conjugate condition, which basically puts a, con uh, a, con a restraint on what the rank of the of the singular cohomology of a complex variety can be. Okay, and so I probably just said if you haven't ever seen these things before, I probably just you know you probably just heard a lot of things that are confusing. But the big point here is that I have four very important theorems in complex algebraic geometry, and they all have to do with differentials somehow. And again, the up you know. I want to emphasize this only holds when x is smooth. And so that's kind of what I want to focus on in the rest of the talk is, you know, what happens when we start looking at singular things. Okay. So before I move on, are there any questions? Can I just ask is, uh, is number one, is that essentially um, like a Gaga principle or is that something like yeah, so Gaga is um, his. I think I think Chow's theorem was proved independently, like before Gaga. Um, Sayers Gaga is more as a statement about saying that um, not only can you, uh, not only are complex projective, or sorry, complex analytic subspaces of projective space algebraic, but actually, you know, their cohomology theories makes sense too that the co you know taking the cohomology of a coherent sheaf analytically is the same thing as taking like the cohomology of its algebraic counterpart this doesn't say that every sheaf on a complex analytic space is algebraic but it says that you can take the analytification functor of an algebraic thing make it analytic and the taking those cohomologies are the same I forget what kind of functor it is. It's a, a yeah, I forget what kind of what 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 the words are describing the functor between uh, these two guys. But that's basically what Gaga says. I believe Gaga does imply Chow's theorem, though. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And one one more thing. It's maybe not super related, but 
if you just have a like say a scheme over C, can you still make sense of the like the canonical uh, canonical bundle where you wedge up to the top power? Yeah, and I'll I'll say something about that. So um, there is a dualizing sheaf. Um, you can make sense of a dualizing sheaf for for schemes as long as they're color Macaulay, um, which is a very very as we'll see, kind of a pretty restrictive condition. Um, or, or a very, sorry, it's not a restrictive condition. Um, it's kind of the bare minimum thing you need. Um, but the, the dualizing property, you know, is not exactly in terms of cohomology. But that's kind of what the rest of the talk is about. Like, what kind of, what kind of, how nice of a statement can we make? Um, generalizing Serre duality, Kodaira vanishing, et cetera. Yeah, good question. All right, so let's talk about differentials with singularities. Um, and so I was emphasizing before that everything had to be smooth. Um, so in particular, if I'm working with a projective variety, uh, which is uh, which has singularities, you know, has pointy edges or you know, uh, cusps, nodes, etc. Then the then the space is no longer a complex manifold, um, and in particular, uh, we can't really make sense of holomorphic differentials on all of X. So what we want to do is kind of make try to find some sort of substitute. Um, in particular, the the four theorems I mentioned above all fail for different reasons when you have singularities. Um, the algebraic differentials still make sense, but they can be very bad. You know, they're no longer vector bundles or locally free sheaves. They um, they are sheaves, but they often have torsion, which is a very bad condition. Like we don't want to deal with things with torsion. Um, Serre duality and Kodaira vanishing fail, um, as stated, with respect to uh, the algebraic differentials, like taking their top wedge, and then the Hodge decomposition theorem fails. Um, so for example, I write down here the main example, um, or the quickest example is probably the nodal elliptic curve. You know, take this guy here. Um, what you can show pretty easily just by drawing some pictures of some pinched tori is that the rank of this guy, um, I believe it's equal to three the singular cohomology. And so, like I was saying before, um, the Hodge decompos if the Hodge decomposition theorem like that held, it would follow by this like conjugate property I was describing that this would have to have even rank. So something's already failing for a very easy example here. Uh, and so the main question here is that can we find a replacement of the algebraic differentials, uh, which satisfies these properties. You know, we want it to be nice. We want it to satisfy Serre duality and Kodaira vanishing and then plays well possibly with Hodge theory. Uh, the answer is kind of, and when I, what do I mean by that? I mean that there are many different ways of generalizing one of these properties, not all matching. And so that's what we're gonna kind of investigate now. Um, so yeah, for now, let X be a projective variety. We're going to assume it's normal. So norm normality just uh, in particular means, um, implies that the singularities aren't too big, um, that we're only having um, singularities in co-dimension two or greater, and that X is Cohen Macaulay. And so if you've uh, gone through Hartshorn, you know what this means. If not, this basically are the bare minimum requirements that we need in order to make sense of like generalizing things to the singular world. Okay. We're going to write omega p now just for the algebraic differentials. Um, and like I was mentioning before, uh, omega p has torsion, you know, basically write down any curve. Um, and unless you're extremely unlucky, write down something with, um, with, with a singularity, a curve and just take its differentials. It's very easy to find you know, examples where um, you have zero divisors and you have torsion, um, which is very bad in practice for you know, 
taking cohomology um, of these things. So one thing we can do is we can kill the torsion. You know, and one way of doing this is taking the reflexive whole. So this is an algebraic fact that extends to the to the sheafy schemey world. That if I take the double dual of um, of a sheaf, then it's torsion. It's going to be torsion free. And I'll make a remark here that um, this process is different than um, just taking omega px and then modding out by the torsion subgroup that these two things are in general different. Um, this is also a process that we could take. Um, it's actually kind of bad. It's not going to give us some nice properties, which is why I'm just describing this one. So this thing is called the, the sheaf of reflexive differentials um, because we're taking the reflexive whole is what it's called. But all we're doing is just taking like the double dual in a sheafy way. So if you've uh, thought about this in a linear algebra way or have done the exercise in like a commutative algebra class where you take the double dual and show it's torsion free, that's the exact same thing that's happening here. Okay, and um, the first lemma is that um, this is a pretty nice object that if um, U is the regular locus of X, i.e. the set of points where X is smooth, which is an open set, and J is uh, the inclusion, and the sheaf of reflexive differentials is just taking that omega P guy on the regular locus, on the smooth thing, and then pushing it forward. So um, we could have gone this route to start out with. We could have just started with a smooth thing, look at its differentials related to X, and then push forward. Turns out it's, it's the same thing as uh, taking the reflexive hole. And what's nice about this sheaf is that it is the perfect replacement for Serre duality, that um, Serre duality holds, as I have stated it um, for the most part, uh, with respect to this dualizing sheaf here. Uh, that the reflexive differentials, the top reflexive differentials are the same as the dualizing sheaf um, omega x. Okay, and the proof is really not that bad. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly describe what you need to check. Um, what, what you need to do is just check that these guys are what are called S2 sheaves, which is kind of a, a, a niche concept that you can find in Hartshorn. You probably skip it when you're going through Hartshorn yourself. Um, but you know, what, what does it mean to be S2? It's basically just a generalization of this complex manifold concept called Hartog's theorem. And um, the upshot is that because we're working with normal things and because we're working with Cohen Macaulay things, um, we only need to check what's happening with these sheaves in co-dimension greater than or equal to two. So this is this concept that like holomorphic functions extend across singularities in co-dimension one, um, that we can fill in uh, holomorphic functions outside of like open, on open sets to, to the whole thing. Okay, um, and then this is, like I said, there are no co-dimension one parts, that's the normality condition. And so we just need to check um, in co-dimension greater than or equal to two, but then it's really pretty easy to check that all these sheaves just agree with each other on the open set U, which is a, you know, so um, that's pretty much the idea. Um, the problem with this sheaf though, is that in general fails Kodaira vanishing, that if you just take, you know, there are examples where you can take a space X a nice ample line bundle and this sheaf and show that the cohomology doesn't vanish. So that this thing doesn't need to be zero for K greater than or equal to zero. And I lay out an example here by Kolar. Um, I believe this example is just taking like a nasty singularity and then take a nasty cone point or something. It's, it's a pretty easy example. You just have to check that it, that it fails it. OK, so I have one sheaf. It does satisfy Serre duality and doesn't, in general, satisfy Kodaira vanishing. 
okay, so maybe there's another method. Maybe there's another way of getting both. And the second method is similar to the lemma that we just described. Maybe we take something smooth where we understand what the differentials look like and we try to get that related to something on X. And that's exactly what we do here. Um, so this, this process only works in characteristic zero because we're, take, we're gonna take a resolution of singularities. So a resolution of singularities is just you know, a birational model where Y is smooth. And so um, we're gonna start off with this. It was proved by Hironaka that these things exist in characteristic zero. Um, and so the nice thing is that the thing upstairs is torsion free, right? So the omega py is torsion free. It's, an, it's a nice vector bundle. And so if I push forward the sheaf, if I take pi and push forward the sheaf, uh, this is also going to be torsion free. So we're already getting a nice object here. And the theorem um, by Brouwer and Ryman Schneider is that this is the object we want if we want to set, you know, study Kodaira vanishing for singularities. So the first thing is that with x and pi above, so if I take x with a resolution of singularities, pi from y to x, then we have a relationship between um, uh, uh, these reflexive forms that the, uh, well, I write M here, so maybe I should be a little more careful that this actually holds in general, that the pi push forward of omega P Y upstairs injects into the thing I was just describing in the first method that the first sheaf I was describing in, uh, uh, is uh, includes this new sheaf. And that for any ample line bundle X on, or L on X and for K greater than or equal to zero, the second sheaf satisfies this Kodaira vanishing property. Okay. So this sheaf is not too far off from the guy that satisfies Sayre duality and it satisfies Kodaira vanishing. Um, maybe uh, for the sake of time, I will skip over the proof uh, because it's a little nuanced uh, and you can find it in like Kolar and Mori's book on birational geometry. But the idea is just that we know Kodaira vanishing holds upstairs on the smooth thing Y. That's what I was saying before um, in the third theorem of the big four that I included. And what we want to do is to use Kodaira vanishing upstairs to say something about Kodaira vanishing downstairs. Okay, so that's basically the proof and you just have to use like higher direct image G's, which no one really wants to play around with anyway. Um, the remark that I'll make, and I've already kind of alluded to it, is that um, the second sheaf omega X, this pi push forward omega top degree Y fails Sayre duality in general. So in particular, um, this inclusion, which I was talking about of these sheaves that Brouwer and Ryman Schneider uh, outlined is, is not an isomorphism in general. So there's, in general, these two sheaves are going to be different. And so we don't have a, well, that, you know, a, a, a singular sheaf necessarily that satisfies Sayre duality and Kodaira vanishing. And so a question you can ask, and it's been a natural question that people have asked for years um, is, you know, when are these things the same? So when is this object, when is this inclusion morphism and isomorphism for each peak? Um, and this problem is called the extension problem. So having such an isomorphism would imply that, you know, you have an object on your space X which satis you know, torsion-free, satisfies Sayre duality, and satisfies Kodaira vanishing. So you have all of these hot ticket items to study um, in the singular world. And so we want to ask, when is this possible? When can we get an isomorphism here? Okay. 
And before I move on, because I'm going to enter a new section, um, are there any questions that I can answer? I'm wondering, is it expected that there would be one chief that would ever do the job or? Um, I don't think so in general. Um, there are only really so many ways. Basically, the only, you know, if you work with a Kon Macaulay thing, you have a dualizing chief. But if you just take a nasty enough thing, you can just show that that, that, that thing doesn't satisfy Kodaira vanishing. So I don't know if there's a great replacement for the dualizing sheaf that um, is canonically constructed in like Hartshorn. That would be my issue with it. Um, uh, there are other ways of constructing differentials. I think this has been studied before, um, but I also don't think they the con these other constructions hold in general either. So yeah, I don't think, uh, it's certainly not a way of constructing this guy, um, an object which does all of these things that you want it to um, without making some assumptions on the singularities. Yeah. And so that's kind of what the, the last part of my talk is going to be about um, is how this extension problem plays with singularities that you might have heard about um, in algebraic geometry talks. Uh, so singularities are kind of nasty objects. They can be arbitrarily bad and therefore like the, their theory can also be arbitrarily bad, um, which is why uh, mathematicians for years now have kind of focused on certain kinds of singularities that show up in the minimal model program. And so I thought it would be interesting just to review what these guys are, um, because you've probably heard their names if you've ever been to an algebraic geometry talk um, or go to algebraic geometry talks, maybe you don't know what they are. Um, so here's a definition, let X be a normal projective variety let uh, pi from y to x be a resolution of singularities with you know, an exceptional divisor e. So what does an exceptional divisor mean? This is just, and I guess this is kind of an assumption, but it's the inverse image of the singular locus of x. So I'm assuming that when you resolve these guys, and here Naka showed this is possible, um, that the inverse image of this guy is going to be in a, you know, a divisor upstairs. And you can actually also show that it's what's called a simple normal crossing divisor, which means that the singularities of this divisor upstairs, you know, they cross like this. Okay, and that is not going to come up at all, but I might say it just to be technically correct uh, in the, for the rest of the talk. Okay, and so, we can write the canonical divisors or the canonical bundles of these guys upstairs in terms of something downstairs uh, or downstairs in terms of something upstairs. So because I've written, you know, because I'm assuming that this is normal, we can write the canonical divisor upstairs, which is just, you know, the divisor associated with omega y as the pullback of the thing downstairs plus multiples of these components EI, okay? Uh, so we're able to do this under some sort of linear, you know, Q linear equivalence um, tilde Q. And so I won't go into what that is right now, but basically I'm able to write it like this. And then we say that X is terminal. If all of these AIs, which are just rational numbers are greater than or greater than zero, we say it's canonical if the AR greater than or equal to zero. We say they're log terminal if the AR greater than minus one. And we say that they're log canonical if the AI are greater than or equal to minus one. Okay, uh, these are birational. Uh, the, these definitions make sense birationally. Um, and the term log comes from the fact that when you have a minus one here, if these AI, you know, for example, are equal to minus one or approaching minus one, that means that your divisors just kind of have poles of that order along 
the singularities. And that's what kind of, that's what log poles tend to look like um, with meromorphic functions on like com uh, complex analytic spaces, for example. So that's kind of where that name is coming from. Uh, these ones are probably the most studied in the MMP. Um, these are probably, you know, um, if you go to any talk dealing with singularities, um, having to do with the minimal model program, these are the most common. But they're not the only ones, and they're actually not the ones I typically study. Um, I kind of study these next objects. We say that X has rational singularities if uh, the push forward of the structure sheaf OY upstairs is equal to the structure sheaf downstairs. This just means that the functions, you see, the holomorphic functions you see upstairs push down to the algebraic functions you see downstairs, and that these higher direct image sheaves vanish on OY. So this is kind of a technical condition. Um, for example, this tells you that the cohomologies upstairs are equal to the cohomologies downstairs. For example, this is just kind of a nice technical property that you might want when studying singularities, um, for example. And then the third one is actually kind of a theorem because the, you know, their definition is so very difficult to describe, but you might have also heard their name. We say that X is, a du is Dubois or has Dubois singularities if and only if this natural morphism, which takes place in, you know, the morphisms in the derived category of X is a quasi isomorphism. Okay. I'm not using this definition at all in the talk. I'm just saying, you know, trying to describe what Dubois singularities are, just so that you have an idea about like where they show up if you go to a talk on these things. Um, Dubois singularities are probably the most general uh, singularities you might see in the MMP. Um, they're also kind of mo most actively studied ones right now um, because of the following implications. Um, so we have this nice little chart here of what singularities imply the other. So as you can tell in the by the definition of like terminal canonical log terminal log canonical going upstairs that there is an implication one you know going this way clearly um, but then there's a relationship between the others which is you know was for a while a very hard thing to show that terminal implies canonical implies log terminal implies log canonical but then these things imply each other and then these things imply each other for instance so there's a relationship between these things. And then kind of at the bottom are Dubois singularities, which is why I'm saying they're kind of the most general singularities you might study in the MMP. Um, right, and so there are implications going the other way once you add some conditions. For example, I think if you put a certain adjective here you have that these are the same and you can put another adjective here and I forget which one it is, but I believe Gorenstein is enough. Gorenstein plus like weekly normal or something. Okay. And so these are the singularities showing up in the MMP. And so we can ask, you know, how does the extension problem play? You know, if I assume that, you know, these guys, you know, my, my space X has at worst these one of these singularities, can I get an isomorphism between uh, the sheaves I was describing above, these reflexive differentials or, you know, these push forward from the resolution sing, uh, differentials. And so the first theorem is that if X has rational singularities, so I'm in this situation right here, then the top degree guys, um, the push forward of the dualizing sheaf upstairs is isomorphic to the push forward of um, the top degree differentials on the regular locus. Okay, so the extension problem holds. So in particular, for rational singularities, um, Sayer duality and Kodaira vanishing hold. And you can tell this is a pretty general space. Rational singularities are probably the 
second nicest kind of singularities you can play around with um, in my mind. And they're kind of the singularities you want to do and want to play around with if you're doing Hodge theory. Uh, a proof of this you can see in Kalar Mori's book, book. It's uh, not very difficult, but it's, uh, I feel like it was a little technical for uh, to give during the talk. Okay, here's another theorem. This is by uh, Greb, uh, Kebekes, Kovac, and Petternell in 2011, and in their like big paper that they all kind of collaborated on at uh, MSRI. Um, if X has log terminal singularities, then this isomorphism holds for each P. So in particular, not only do Podaira vanishing and Serre duality hold for um, spaces with log terminal singularities, but this isomorphism holds for every sequence of differentials, you know, for P less than or equal to the top dimension. Okay. Um, so this was, this is kind of an older result at this point, uh, about 10 years. Um, but this doesn't say, you know, so I have these two results, one about rational singularities and one about log terminal singularities. And remember log terminal singularities imply rational, but not, you know, the, the theorem by Greb, Kebekesh, Kovac, and Petternell don't uh, say anything about rational singularities, but this was resolved by Kebekesh and Schnell in 2018, that if X has rational singularities, then B, this isomorphism holds for each P less than or equal to the dimension. Okay. Um, the proof is pretty cute. Um, it, it, you know, it's the, it's the entire, pretty much the entirety of their 40 to 50 page paper, but they basically use Saito's theory of mixed Hodge modules to show that it's enough to reduce to this case in which it's already known. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bonkers cool paper um, using a very technical result to prove something and you know, reduce it to a very easy problem. Um, something I've been kind of reading the past couple of months, which is why I'm giving this talk. Um, okay, but you know, let's look at the MMP. So what have we covered? We've we've shown that the ex, you know we've discussed that the extension problem basically holds for these guys here, which means that it holds for these guys here. Um, so what are we left with? We're, we're we're left with like log canonical and Dubois singularities. And I've already said that there are examples where code you know the extension problem fails that there that these two sheaves aren't isomorphic to each other. And that actually takes place um, uh, at the level of Dubois singularities. So for Dubois singularities, we're not gonna get such a nice theorem, but uh, we can say something slightly related. And so this is this theorem of Kovac and Schwede and Smith from 2007, that if X is a Colin Macaulay, space and X has to then X has to block singularities if and only if this version of the extension problem with logarithmic singularities um, this injection is an isomorphism so um, again I didn't talk about what like this log e thing is here um, and I won't really say it right now um, but basically I'm saying that there are versions of the extension problem with which hold for Dubois singularities, um, except that this sheaf here doesn't really satisfy Kodaira vanishing or anything. So it's independent in its own right. You know, it's, it's interesting in its own right to consider when this thing is an isomorphism, but it doesn't quite do what we want. So Dubois singularities, yeah, it's, it's a little up in the air how nice um, of a theory we can get. And then Kavakish and Schnell also showed that in general, if uh, we have one implication, you know, if the top degree thing holds, so we're in the Dubois setting, then it actually holds for all kind, every kind of uh, differential uh, for all P. So for all of these uh, logarithmic P differentials and then these uh, holomorphic P differentials on the regular locus. So the similar statement that I was saying up above. Okay, maybe I'll skip this next part um, and end with just some applications of the extension theorem in the literature. Um, the extension theorem has been used a bunch of times to prove, you know, uh, in recent years to prove some uh, pretty interesting results. For example, my advisor and his co-author Christian Schnell use um, 
the extension problem, the fact that this guy can be an isomorphism. For each P, for rational singularities, to study the Hodge theory, deformation theory, and um, some local and global theorems for singular symplectic varieties. So this is their papers from, uh, I think they're put on the archive in 2016 and 2018. Um, I've also, this is kind of something I'm wrapping up on right now. I'm also doing something similar for symplectic varieties and the extension theorem, uh, studying uh, the intersection cohomology of these objects. So I hope to have that up on the archive in the next month or two. Uh, it's also been, you know, the extension problem has also been used to study the Beauville Bogomolov decomposition for K trivial varieties, um, which is an interesting theorem. It's, you know, this is a, an older result in the smooth manifold case or the, the complex manifold case, which says that anything with like trivial canonical bundle can be covered by Calabiao's, Tori, or symplectic varieties. And this has been um, analogs of this have been proven. Uh, in the singular case um, by various authors. Um, I think my, for example, my, my advisor and his co-authors have kind of put the finishing touches on versions of this theorem for uh, non-projective things, which I think for the most part has wrapped up the entire problem of extending it to, to certain singularities. And then finally, there's this uh, litman zariski conjecture, which is actually very easy to state, which uses the extension theorem. And it's uh, still an open conjecture in general. Um, and it has been for about 50 years um, that if the tangent sheaf, which is just the dual of the sheaf of differentials, uh, if this guy is locally free, then X is smooth. And so this is kind of, you know, an old conjecture. It's been studied in many different cases. And just because I'm running out of time, I'll just state a version of the theorem, which is, uh, uh, has, you know, has to do with the extension problem. Suppose that the natural morphism between these two objects, omega push forward, uh, sorry, pi push forward of omega one, into J push forward of omega one X reg is an isomorphism. So the extension problem holds for, uh, for one forms. Then the Zariski Lippmann conjecture holds that if TX is locally free, then X is smooth. And so I'll skip over the proof for now. Maybe I can return to it if people are interested, but the upshot here is that the Zariski Lippmann conjecture is I believe completely solved for KLT singularities uh, or just log terminal singularities by this uh, paper I was talking about of Greg Kevakish, Kovach, and Pedernel, and rational singularities as well by Kevakish and uh, 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 Schnell. Um, and then it's also been studied um, in you know by Graf and Kovach for log canonical singularities, which it turns out is equivalent to the problem for Dubois singularities as well. So uh, the sync for the singularities showing up in the MMP problem, the Zariski Lippmann conjecture, this very easy thing to state has been wrapped up at this point, but it's still an open problem in general. All right. Thank you guys for enter, you know, listening. <laughs> Sorry, I had a phone call at the same time. Uh, look good and thank, thank Ben for a wonderful talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I have a, a vague question, um, which like I barely understand myself, the question. So like, I'm not expecting a, an answer necessarily, but like, um, is there a kind of approach to all this kind of stuff where instead of using uh, like the, the complex differential forms, you use the whole like cotangent complex, like this whole like derived algebraic geometry approach that's, you know, so fancy these days. Like, is there some 
similar story that happens there where this can detect smoothness? Does this like solve any problems or is it totally different? Yeah, maybe I'll slightly point you to, um, maybe I won't scroll up, maybe I'll just write under here. Um, so the definition of Dubois singularities, um, the, the, the construction of Dubois singularities was done in like the 80s uh, to try and generalize the Duram complex for, for smooth and complex manifolds. And the reason that I didn't bring up its definition is because it depends on a hyper-resolution of simplicial sh um, schemes of, uh, of a space and with like 10 conditions or something on like the graded components of this complex, um, which is why I just brought up this, this theorem of um, Carl Schwede because it's very easy to state and it doesn't depend on a hyper-resolution. Um, so yeah, the Dubois complex, you know, I forget what it, how people write it. I think it's just you know something like this in the literature. Um, very much is you know was and was and is um, how people studied you know singularities um, kind of in this derived complex way. Um, another way you can study singularities in this derived category world is the intersection complex, which maybe you know about. Um, and this is kind of how Kevikish and Schnell uh, proved their extension theorems. Um, they turn the problem of uh, uh, extending these differentials across singularities to studying um, the Duram complex of like the underlying D module on the intersection complex ICX you know, for a complex space, you know, you kind of look at the graded pieces of this guy and um, what you can do and what you can show is that there are some other pieces, if you know what the decomposition theorem is, you have some other pieces which are supported on the singular locus and that these are isomorphic to the higher direct push forward sheaves of, um, on a resolution. And the upshot here is that if I take, you know, a certain sheafy cohomology of this thing, then I can relate these push forward guys to certain uh, sheafy cohomologies of these graded pieces in this complex. And as it'll turn out, we, that's it. We don't get these guys supported on the singular locus. And so what they do is that they use this decomposition, they use this identification to show that extending singularities this way is equivalent to looking at the dim support of this guy and showing that this actually holds for rational singularities. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cute way, but it does definitely use like, you know, there's a derived way of studying these guys um, using the decomposition theorem um, for Hodge modules. Okay, that's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is something, maybe you mentioned it earlier, but in this situation, do you have analogs of the, the, the sort of Hodge decomposition and filtration on that? So that part still go through? <laughs> what, what, <laughs> Yeah, so um, there are ways of extending the Hodge decomposition theorem. Um, I just, when I was writing this up, I just decided to avoid it because it was just another kind of list of theorems to, to, to bring up. But basically, um, Hodge theory makes sense for orbifolds the things which are locally quotients. Um, they also kind of make sense for rational singularities. Like, as I've stated, the Hodge decomposition theorem, they also make sense for cohomology in rank less than or equal to two, which is actually a very nice thing to have because the H2 kind of contains the line bundles and the ample bundles and stuff. So. Um, 
having a decomposition like that is extremely useful. Um, but then also just in general, there's this idea of mixed Hodge structures and um, this was Deline's thesis, I believe, um, where he showed that um, uh, any the cohomology of any space, any any projective space, I think a priori, but basically anything that emits a resolution um, of singularities emits a mixed Hodge structure. So it's not as nice as a pure Hodge structure. You're not going to get as nice of a decomposition. But basically, it's saying that there's like two filtrations. You have the Hodge filtration going one way, and you have the weight filtration going the other way. You can form like graded components on the weight filtration on the on the cohomology, and these things form pure Hodge structures. So it just says that like you take certain graded components of the cohomology then this can this has a decomposition this has a, this is a pure hodge structure yeah but a lot of the time you know there is a pure hodge structure um, on these guys so for example if you don't want to study cohomology you can study intersection cohomology and it turns out that for projective guys this is these things are always pure hodge structures Uh, any any other questions? So if not, let's, uh, let's thank Ben once more. I'll uh, I'll stop the recording. Uh,